Welcome to the new world of animal allies, the doctors, volunteers, pet owners and other surprising visitors who are out there making a difference. In Animal Doctors, Doc Rogers has a problem with the local lion pride. In the UK, animal helper Jo Buchan leaves her dreary office to feed flesh-eating piranhas. This week's How To looks at flea prevention. And at the Stuttgart Zoo, Animal World takes a look at a very enthusiastic group of orphans. Dr. Peter Rogers is the resident vet at the Kapama Game Reserve in South Africa. He has a problem. Morning, it's, it's Peter Rogers speaking here. Mark those, um, remember those two little lion cubs that we did the post-mortems on two weeks ago? Those two little ones um, of, of eaters. Um, they actually, you know, as we suspected, they've come back positive. Uh, the histopathologist confirmed that they were actually vitamin A deficient. Saturday morning and Peter joins the daily feeding run to get much needed vitamin supplement into pregnant and nursing lionesses as quickly as possible. Ready? Peter believes that the deficiency in the diet of the lions is caused by the fact that they're eating prepared meat rather than live prey. Those last little cubs that we that we uh, checked out, they came back positive for um, that vitamin A deficiency. So the reason why I'm here today really is that I want to uh, inject all the pregnant females with with vitamin A. In order to get the supplement into these animals, Peter's going to have to fire a hypodermic needle through the fence. This is no ordinary hypodermic. At one end, a thick needle. At the other, a charge of hand-pumped compressed air. Somewhere in the middle, the vitamin A. When it hits, the hypodermic literally fires the supplement into the animal. The lions won't feel a thing, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be keen on the idea. And unfortunately for Peter, they know him by sight. And more particularly, they know that if he's nearby, a needle in the backside is just around the corner. He tries to hide in the meat wagon. Shumba is cautious, probably because she's still suckling young. But this is exactly why she needs the supplement. The vitamin will get to the cubs through her milk. Don't let it come too close, Mark. Okay, we got her. There we go. On to the next pen. This is home to Spider, a pregnant female and her male partner who's hungry. Spider's very wary and clearly doesn't like the look of the audience. Okay. The prospect of food overrides her cautiousness, but she proves too lithe for Peter, who can't get a clear shot. I've got to get a side on shot. They'll have to hope for better luck tomorrow. Next in line for a vitamin boost is Nandi. Nandi means the sweet one in Zulu, and Peter's hoping she'll live up to her name today because he needs to get a little too close for comfort to guarantee a direct hit. The lions keep their distance. They don't like intruders, but they are expecting to be fed, so they're sticking around to see what happens. That's Nandy taken care of. The dart will fall out in a few moments, and the team can go in and retrieve it. The pink feather makes it easier to find. To prevent more cubs from dying, Peter will need to do this every month until he's confident that the problem has been eradicated. Shumba and Tommy are two cubs who are flourishing. Now three months old, they're getting on nicely. They are, however, suffering from a nasty case of ticks. I've only got ten fingers and I need them all. What's, what's, you say these little guys have got lots of ticks in them? I see they've just come from their own little sheltered pens and they've still got a bit of, a bit of resistance to these ticks, so we'll just treat them for a couple of times. 
We'll use this long acting pour on stuff. We'll just put it down the back. And uh, that should do the trick as long as I don't take off my fingers when we do it. I'll just do it on the back here. Okay, so we're gonna use double the cattle dough. So it's one mil per 10K, so we'll call it say 15 mils for Shumba. Peter hopes to complete this task and keep all his fingers. This medicine should keep the cubs clear of ticks for several weeks. Now these little guys, you know, they're hand reared, but they still, uh, they still remain a wild animal, eh? Okay, this is... Okay, that went on nicely. Okay, so it's just pour on formulation down the back and it just uh, gets absorbed into the, to the to oily layer on the skin. Okay. Tommy next. There we are. This is two little Tommy here. Okay. There you are. Maybe give Tommy a little bit more because some of it went over the top of him. Okay. Where are the ticks mainly, Mark? Okay, there we go. That's fine. As the patients were so well behaved, they get a bit of a treat. These guys are still a bit young to be hunting and are just starting to come off their mother's milk. <coughs> okay. Okay, that should just keep an eye on them if you keep it. That should last for about three weeks to a month or so. Eh? Okay. That'll be fine. In Animal Doctors Part 2, we'll catch up with Doc Rogers as he attempts to guide two visitors back to the wild. Feeding time at the Piranha Fish Tank at London Aquarium, and it's one of the biggest attractions here. Pacing the length of the tank, the pack is excited by the gathering group of expectant onlookers. But it's not a staff member risking life and limb to feed these legendary predators. It's one of the aquarium's ever-enthusiastic volunteers who gets this job. Meet Joe Buchan, one of the frontline troops. Every Friday that I come in, it's a completely different set of things. So, you know, one week I might be, you know, spending my whole day cleaning out various fridges and freezers and things like that. Um, or doing the feeds, um, following the aquarists around, learning out more, um, more about the fish. It's straight into preparing breakfast for the thousands of tiny and not so tiny aquatic creatures that live here. Many different kinds of marine and freshwater life call the London Aquarium home. Each one of them has individual needs, so their food must be specially prepared to match diets found in the wild. Jo has her work cut out even before she starts to feed the fish. Um, I am cutting up the sprat for the Atlantic dive. Um, they need to be in small bits because basically just needs to be big enough for the fish to eat them. Jo finds out her favourite job is up next. Ten of those trout, yeah. six for the piranhas, six for the um, four for the rainforest feed, and then yeah. cut up the rest in small pieces. Yeah, sure. It's the messiest and the smelliest yeah. job of the day. The Squashing the insides out of trout isn't everybody's idea of a day off, but Jo's glad to get the worst over first. When I was younger, we used to go back on fishing. My grand, we used to gut the fish, and I always used to hate it. The smell it's just, oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> Joe's enthusiasm makes her one of the London Aquarium's most valued helpers. There's a lot of mouths to feed and no time to waste. We're feeding the piranhas for the public, so um, we like to kind of make a big show out of doing it. So, you know, you kind of put them in one at a time and put them in different parts of the tank and things like that so people can see it. And a lot of the time they're kind of expecting half cows to be low, uh, lowered into the tank. So quite often they're disappointed that you're just throwing trout in, which are about this big. Um, but people do like to see the piranhas and they do like to see the sharks. So we like to make a big thing out of, out of those two things. And people are usually like, ooh, piranhas. 
Next in line for their breakfast are the archer fish, a big favourite with young. Joe believes the aquarium plays an important role in helping people, especially children, understand and respect the world's oceans and the amazing creatures that live in them. And also, once I had a little girl who was absolutely terrified of sharks. Um, she hated them. She wouldn't even go anywhere near the shark tank. Um, but, you know, when you sit them down and you explain to them, you know, what sharks are really like and you tell them a bit more about it, then people kind of, you know, appreciate sharks and perhaps aren't so afraid of them to make kids especially realize that you know every time that you go into the waters that you're not going to be eaten by a shark is you know it's quite rewarding there are hundreds of tanks here and each one has to be cleaned and vacuumed at some point well basically this whole the whole system is on a filter so the water's always circulating around um, but all the kind of stuff that sinks to the bottom we, doesn't get kicked up so basically that's what i'm doing now i'm just getting all the stuff off the of the tank. So spare a thought for animal helpers everywhere like Joe, who give their time and effort ensuring that good work like this can continue. <laughs> After the break, animal allies will be back with new ammunition to fight fleas. And Doc Rogers helps two cheetahs return to the wild. Fleas are one of the most common health problems cats encounter and their itchy effects are difficult to ignore. Animal Allies shows how simple it can be to rid a cat of fleas and keep them away for good. Tiptoes is a stray tabby with new owners who want to adopt him, but Amelia and her mother Belinda suspect he has fleas, so they've come to Dr Justin Braun for help. Hi, I'm Amelia. And uh, this is... Firstly, Dr. Justine checks for evidence of fleas living in Tiptoe's coat. Yeah, there's quite a quite a bit of flea dirt here. Uh -huh. If you have a look carefully at these little black speckles, mm -hmm. um, that that is flea dirt. So to not... kill adult fleas, a treatment is applied to the skin behind Tiptoe's head, where he can't lick it off. Is it? Yeah, it's very it simple. You don't rub it in. Just close Just the fur. The solution dissolves into the natural oily layer covering the hair and skin and will be stored in the skin glands for a month, during which time it will kill all adult fleas. Reapply every four weeks. But the fleas living on tiptoes are only 5% of the problem. The main concern is the flea eggs lurking at home in the carpets, bedding and furniture. This injection breaks the fleas' life cycle by making adult fleas feeding on the cat infertile. This is just the injection. To prevent future flea problems, cats should be given this injection every six months. Dr. Justine also suggests a spray for the house to kill any fleas or flea eggs. Thank you. You're very lucky to have such a lovely cat. Thank you very nice much. Nice to meet you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. So for this week's Animal Allies How To, check for fleas by combing the cat's coat and inspecting the skin for flea dirt. Target adult fleas with a suitable product. Break the flea's life cycle with a treatment aimed at preventing flea eggs from developing. Spray the cat's home environment for fleas and flea eggs. Orangutans are one of the most endearing and popular animals in the zoo. But these ancient primates have a real fight for survival, as there are as few as 20,000 left in the wild. This is the primate nursery at Wilhelma Zoo in Stuttgart, Germany. The European Endangered Species Breeding Programme is run from here. It has many young to care for, including baby chimpanzees, gorillas and, of course, orangutans. Any young primate in Europe who's been orphaned or rejected by its mother comes here. Gundy Sharp is the keeper in charge of the nursery and she acts as mum to many of these young apes. 
this particular species is probably the European Species Survival Plan, which is called the EP, because they try to you know, get uh, unrelated individuals together, so in 100 years of time we're not ending up in having inbred orangutans all over the place. There are various reasons why this nursery is so important to future generations of primates. It creates an environment where the apes can learn all the things they'll need to survive, live with each other and care for their own young when they eventually mature. But more importantly, the nursery helps to protect the species' gene pool. Because there are not many of these animals left, experts fear they'll become inbred so they've begun to keep a stud book. The orangutan stud book is kept by Laurie Perkins at Atlanta Zoo in the US. She coordinates which animals can mate. This ensures that animals that are related don't end up mating with one another. Well, being a being a stud bookkeeper for the orangutans involves keeping track of all of the events in the population worldwide. The stud book is the starting point for any kind of captive breeding program and is the species insurance policy. If disaster strikes the wild population, then at least the captive animals will be able to continue mating and save the species. To ultimately end up with a baby, um, you start with a, a genetic analysis of the, of the stud book data and we go through and we run a series of programs that have been written especially for the management of small populations. The stud book ensures the widest gene pool is available for breeding. Stuttgart is part of the captive breeding management plan and works with Atlanta Zoo and others to build up stocks of orangutans and other apes. These young ones at the Stuttgart nursery are not necessarily there to build up stocks for reintroduction. They also maintain the widest possible genetic diversity, so that if orangutans become extinct in the wild, or the wild genetic pool becomes too small, new blood can be introduced from the captive animals. In an ideal world, the best survival plan for the species is to preserve their natural habitat, but in the meantime, these baby orangutans are the species' best insurance policy. Back at the Kapama Game Reserve and Doc Rogers is getting ready to escort a couple of important guests off the premises. These two wild male cheetahs were brought in to mate with the female breeding stock. They're now ready to return to the wild. Thanks for helping us here. I know it's not part of your job, but the reason is we've got these, you know, these two wild cheetahs of Kapama. We brought them in here to, uh, to see if they'll mate with the females. So, you know, it's quite hot now and they've been in for a couple of days. They're quite hungry, so we're going to just chase them back out in, I'm onto, just... onto Kapama again. So if you can just help us with this men, we'll form this human chain here. Okay. And we're going to try and chase them out that gate at the bottom. Okay. 100%. Right, so we'll just take it slowly. They're going to they're come out of there now. Okay. And then back onto Kapama, hopefully. Okay. The cheetahs need little persuasion and wander casually back into the bush. The cheetah as a species is in trouble and that's why the breeding program is so important. Most cubs don't survive in the wild and the species has grown weak through a shrinking gene pool. This female cheetah was reared by hand. She's part of Kapama's breeding program.
it's becoming increasingly typical that the cheetahs of Africa are more domestic pet than wild beast of the savannah. Their very existence depends on human intervention. Before the Ice Age, there were a number of different species of cheetah. Now there's only one, and all the animals are closely related. That's bad news for any species. Breeding programs try to improve the gene pool as much as possible. This young female is a very important player in the survival of her species. I think you must get out your vehicle so that I can see you there. They don't walk in between the vehicles. Eh? The cheetahs come extremely close to the people, but this is not as dangerous as it seems. They're used to humans. Most wild cheetahs in the area will have had some contact with mankind. Oh, I don't want to go up. The visit was too good. The cheetahs are out, and another day's work is done for Doc Rogers. Mission accomplished. In the next programme, the new world of animal allies continues when Animal World travels to find the planet's biggest herd of elephants. And ever wanted to own a champion show cat? How to gets the inside story. There are ways to make